Chapter 19 A Pleasant Day with an Unpleasant Termination The birds, who, happily for their own peace of mind and personal comfort, were in blissful ignorance of the preparations which had been making to astonish them on a first of September, hailed it, no doubt, as one of the pleasantest mornings they had seen that season. Many a young partridge who strutted complacently among the stubble, with all the finicking coxcombry of youth, and many an older one who watched his levity out of his little round eye, with the contemptuous air of a bird of wisdom and experience, alike unconscious of their approaching doom, basked in the fresh morning air with lively and blithesome feelings, and a few hours afterwards were laid low upon the earth. But we grow affecting. Let us proceed. In plain, commonplace matter-of-fact, then, it was a fine morning. So fine that you would scarcely have believed that the few months of an English summer had yet flown by. Hedges, fields and trees, hill and moorland, presented to the eye their ever-varying shades of deep, rich green. Scarce a leaf had fallen, scarce a sprinkle of yellow mingled with the hues of summer, warned you that autumn had begun. The sky was cloudless. The sun shone out bright and warm. The songs of birds and hum of myriads of summer insects filled the air. And the cottage gardens, crowded with flowers of every rich and beautiful tint, sparkled in the heavy dew like beds of glittering jewels. Everything bore the stamp of summer, and none of its beautiful colors had yet faded from the dye. Such was the morning when an open carriage in which were three Picklickians Mr. Snodgrass, having preferred to remain at home, Mr. Wardle, and Mr. Trundle, with Sam Weller on the box beside the driver, pulled up by a gate at the roadside, before which stood a tall, raw-boned gamekeeper and a half-booted, leather-legged boy, each bearing a bag of capacious dimensions and accompanied by a brace of pointers. "'I say,' whispered Mr. Winkle to Wardle, as the man let down the steps, "'they don't suppose we're going to kill game enough to fill those bags, do they?' "'Fill them!' exclaimed old Wardle. "'Bless you, yes! You shall fill one, and I the other. "'And when we've done with them, the pockets of our shooting jackets will hold as much more.' Mr. Winkle dismounted without saying anything in reply to this observation. But he thought within himself that if the party remained in the open air till he had filled one of the bags, they stood a considerable chance of catching tolerable colds in the head. "'I do know, lass. I, old girl. Down, daff, down!' said Wardle, caressing the dogs. Sir Geoffrey's still in Scotland, of course, Martin? The tall gamekeeper replied in the affirmative, and looked with some surprise from Mr. Winkle, who was holding his gun as if he wished his coat pocket to save him the trouble of pulling the trigger, to Mr. Tupman, who was holding his as if he were afraid of it, as there is no earthly reason to doubt that he really was. My friends are not so much in the way of this sort of thing yet, Martin, said Wardle, noticing the look. Live and learn, you know. They'll be good shots one of these days. I beg my friend Winkle's pardon, though. He has had some practice. Mr. Winkle smiled feebly over his blue neckerchief in acknowledgment of the compliment, and got himself so mysteriously entangled with his gun in his modest confusion that if the piece had been loaded, he must inevitably have shot himself dead upon the spot. You mustn't handle your piece in that air way when you come to have the charge in it, sir, said the tall gamekeeper gruffly or I'm damned if you won't make cold meat of some on it. Mr. Winkle, thus admonished, abruptly altered its position, and in doing so, contrived to bring the barrel into pretty smart contact with Mr. Weller's head. Hello, said Sam, picking up his hat, which had been knocked off and rubbing his temple. Hello, sir. If you come at this way, you'll fill one of the bags and something to spare at one fire. Here the leather-legged boy laughed very heartily, and then tried to look as if it was somebody else whereat Mr. Winkle frowned majestically. "'Where did you tell the boy to meet us with the snack, Martin?' inquired Wardle. "'Shine of One Tree Hill at twelve o'clock, sir. "'That's not Sir Geoffrey's land, is it?' "'No, sir, but it's close by it. "'It's Captain Boldwig's land, but there'll be nobody to interrupt us, "'and there's a fine bit of turf there.' "'Very well,' said Lord Wardle. "'Now the sooner we're off, the better. "'Will you join us at twelve, then, Pickwick?' "'Mr. Pickwick was particularly desirous to view the sport,' the more especially as he was rather anxious in respect of Mr. Winkle's life and limbs. On so inviting a morning, too, it was very tantalizing to turn back and leave his friends to enjoy themselves. It was, therefore, 
With a very rueful air that he replied, Why, I suppose I must. Ain't the gentleman a shot, sir? inquired the long gamekeeper. No, replied Wardle, and he's lame beside. I should very much like to go, said Mr. Pickwick. Very much. There was a short pause of commiseration. There's a barrow to the side of the hedge, said the boy. If the gentleman's servant would wheel along the paths, he could keep this nigh us, and we could lift it over the stiles and that. The way thing, said Mr. Weller, who was a party interested in as much as he ardently longed to see the sport. The way thing. Well said, Shmochek. I'll have it out in a minute. But here a difficulty arose. The long gamekeeper resolutely protested against the introduction into a shooting party of a gentleman in a barrow as a gross violation of all established rules and precedents. It was a great objection but not an insurmountable one. The gamekeeper, having been coaxed and feed, and having, moreover, eased his mind by punching the head of the inventive youth who had first suggested the use of the machine, Mr. Pickwick was placed in it, and off the party set. Wardle and the long gamekeeper leading the way, and Mr. Pickwick in the barrow, propelled by Sam, bringing up the rear. Stop, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, when they had got half across the first field. What's the matter now? said Wardle. I won't suffer this bear to be moved another step, said Mr. Pickwick resolutely, unless Winkle carries that gun of his in a different manner. How am I to carry it? said the wretched Winkle. Carry it with the muzzle to the ground, replied Mr. Pickwick. It's so unsportsmanlike, reasoned Winkle. I don't care whether it's unsportsmanlike or not, replied Pickwick. I am not going to be shot in a wheelbarrow for the sake of appearances to please anybody. I know that gentleman will put that air charge into somebody before he's done, growled the long man. "'Well, well, I don't mind,' said poor Mr. Winkle, turning his gun stock uppermost. "'There. Anything for a quiet life,' said Mr. Weller, and on they went again. "'Stop,' said Mr. Pickwick, after they had gone a few yards further. "'What now?' said Wardle. "'That gun of Tupman's is not safe. I know it isn't,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'Who? Eh? What? Not safe?' said Mr. Tupman, in a tone of great alarm. "'Not as you are carrying it.' said Mr. Pickwick. I'm very sorry to make any further objection, but I cannot consent to go on unless you carry it as Winkle does his. I think you had better, sir, said the long gamekeeper, or you're quite as likely to lodge the charge in your own viscuit as anybody else's. Mr. Tupman, with the most obliging haste, placed his piece in the position required, and the party moved on again, the two amateurs marching with reversed arms, like a couple of privates at a royal funeral. The dogs suddenly came to a dead stop, and the party advancing stealthily a single pace stopped too. "'What's the matter with the dog's legs?' whispered Mr. Winkle. "'How queer they're standing.' "'Hush, can't you?' replied Wardle softly. "'Don't you see? They're making a point.' "'Making a point?' said Mr. Winkle, staring about him as if he expected to discover some particular beauty in the landscape which the sagacious animals were calling special attention to. "'Making a point? What are they pointing at?' "'Keep your eyes open,' said Wardle, not heeding the question in the excitement of the moment." Now then, there was a sharp whirring noise that made Mr. Winkle start back as if he had been shot himself. Bang, bang, went a couple of guns. The smoke swept quickly away over the field and curled into the air. Where are they? said Mr. Winkle in a state of the highest excitement, turning round and round in all directions. Where are they? Tell me when to fire. Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? said Wardle, taking up a brace of birds which the dogs had deposited at his feet. Where are they? Why, here they are. No, no, I mean the others, said the bewildered Winkle. "'Far enough off by this time,' replied Wardle, coolly reloading his gun. "'We shall very likely be up with another covey in five minutes,' said the long gamekeeper. "'If the gentleman begins to fire now, perhaps he'll just get the shot out of the barrel by the time they rise.' (laughs) "'Ha-ha-ha-ha!' roared Mr. Weller. "'Sam,' said Mr. Pickwick, compassionating his follower's confusion and embarrassment. "'Je? Don't laugh.' "'Jutney not, je?' So, by way of indemnification, Mr. Weller contorted his features from behind the wheelbarrow, for the exclusive amusement of the boy with the leggings, who thereupon burst into a boisterous laugh, and was summarily cuffed by the long gamekeeper, who wanted a pretext for turning round to hide his own merriment. "'Brave old fellow,' said Wardle to Mr. Tupman. "'You fired that time at all events.' "'Oh, yes,' replied Tupman, with conscious pride. "'I let it off.' "'Well done. You'll hit something next time if you look sharp. Very easy, ain't it?' "'Yes, it's very easy,' said Mr. Tupman. "'How it hurts one's shoulder, though.' It nearly knocked me backwards. I had no idea these small firearms kicked so. Ah, said the old gentleman, smiling. You'll get used to it in time. Now then, all ready. All right with the barrel there? All right, eh? replied Mr. Weller. Come along, then. Out, out, eh? said Sam, raising the barrel. Aye, aye, replied Mr. Pickwick. And on they went as briskly as need be. 
Keep that barrow back now, cried Wardle, when it had been hoisted over a stile into another field, and Mr. Pickwick had been deposited in it once more. All right, eh? replied Mr. Weller, pausing. Now, Winkle, said the old gentleman, follow me softly, and don't be too late this time. Never fear, said Mr. Winkle. Are they pointing? No, no, not now. Quietly now, quietly. On they crept, and very quietly they would have advanced. If Mr. Winkle, in the performance of some very intricate evolutions with his gun, had not accidentally fired, at the most critical moment, over the boy's head, exactly in the very spot where the tall man's brain would have been, had he been there instead. "'Why, what on earth did you do that for?' said old Wardle, as the birds flew unharmed away. "'I never saw such a gun in my life,' replied poor Winkle, looking at the lock, as if that would do any good. "'It goes off on its own accord. It will do it.' "'Will do it?' echoed Wardle, with something of irritation in his manner. "'I wish it would kill something of its own accord.' "'It'll do that afore long, sir,' observed the tall man, in a low, prophetic voice. "'What do you mean by that observation, sir?' inquired Mr. Winkle angrily. "'Never mind, sir, never mind,' replied the long gamekeeper. "'I have no family myself, sir, and this here boy's mother will get something handsome from Sir Geoffrey if he's killed on his land. Load again, sir, load again.' "'Take away his gun!' cried Mr. Pickwick from the barrow, horror-stricken at the long man's dark insinuations. "'Take away his gun! Do you hear somebody?' Nobody, however, volunteered to obey the command, and Mr. Winkle, after darting a rebellious glance at Mr. Pickwick, reloaded his gun and proceeded onwards with the rest. We are bound on the authority of Mr. Pickwick to state that Tupman's mode of proceeding evinced far more of prudence and deliberation than that adopted by Mr. Winkle. Still, this by no means detracts from the great authority of the latter gentleman on all matters connected with the field, because, as Mr. Pickwick beautifully observes, it has somehow or other happened from time immemorial that many of the best and ablest philosophers, who have been perfect lights of science in matters of theory, have been wholly unable to reduce them to practice. Mr. Tupman's process, like many of our most sublime discoveries, was extremely simple. With the quickness and penetration of a man of genius, he had at once observed that the two great points to be attained were, first, to discharge his piece without injury to himself, and, secondly, to do so without danger to the bystanders. Obviously, the best thing to do, after surmounting the difficulty of firing at all, was to shut his eyes firmly and fire into the air. On one occasion, after performing this feat, Mr. Tupman, on opening his eyes, beheld a plump partridge in the very act of falling wounded to the ground. He was just on the point of congratulating Wardle on his invariable success, when that gentleman advanced towards him and grasped him warmly by the hand. Tupman, said the old gentleman, you singled out that particular bird? No, said Mr. Tupman. No. You did, said Wardle. I saw you do it. I observed you pick him out. I noticed you as you raised your piece to take aim, and I will say this, that the best shot in existence could not have done it more beautifully. You are an older hand at this than I thought you, Tupman. You have been out before. It was in vain for Mr. Tupman to protest with a smile of self-denial that he never had. The very smile was taken as evidence to the contrary, and from that time forth, his reputation was established. It is not the only reputation that has been acquired as easily, nor are such fortunate circumstances confined to partridge shooting. Meanwhile, Mr. Winkle flashed and blazed and smoked away without producing any material results worthy of being noted down, sometimes expending his charge in midair, and at others sending it skimming along so near the surface of the ground as to place the lives of the two dogs on a rather uncertain and precarious tenure. As a display of fancy shooting, it was extremely varied and curious. As an exhibition of firing with any precise object, it was, upon the whole, perhaps a failure. It is an established axiom that every bullet has its billet. If it apply in an equal degree to shots, those of Mr. Winkle were unfortunate foundlings, deprived of their natural rights, cast loose upon the world, and billeted nowhere. Well, said Wardle, walking up to the side of the barrow and wiping the streams of perspiration from his jolly red face. Smoking day, isn't it? It is indeed, replied Mr. Pickwick. The sun is tremendously hot, even to me. I don't know how you must feel it. Why, said the old gentleman, pretty hot. It's past twelve, though. You see that green hill there? Certainly. That's the place where we are to lunch. And by Jove, there's the boy with the basket. Punctual as clockwork. So he is, said Mr. Pickwick, 
brightening up. Good boy, that. I'll give him a shilling presently. Now then, Sam, wheel away. Oh, well down, Jay, said Mr. Weller, invigorated with the prospect of refreshments. Out of the vibe, young ladies. If you wally my precious life, don't upset me, as the gentleman said to the driver when they was carrying him to Tibbin. And quickening his pace to a sharp run, Mr. Weller wheeled his master out nimbly to the green hill, shot him dexterously out by the very side of the basket, and proceeded to unpack it with the utmost dispatch. Wheel pie, said Mr. Weller, soliloquizing as he arranged the eatables on the grass. Really good thing is a wheel pie, when you know that the lady has made it, and is quite sure it ain't kittens. And out of all, though, where's the odds? When they're sure like wheel that they're really pie in themselves, don't know the difference. Don't they, Sam? replied Mr. Pickwick. Not they, sir, replied Mr. Weller, touching his hat. I lodged in the same house with the pie man once, sir, and a really nice man he was. Regular clever chap, too. Make pies out of anything, he good. What number of cats you keep, Mr. Brooks, says I, when I'd got intimate with him. Ah, says he, I do. A good many, says he. You must be really fond of cats, says I. Other people is, says he, a winking at me. They ain't in cheese until the winter, though, says he. Not in season, says I. No, says he. Fruits is in, catch is out. Why, what do you mean, says I? Mean, says he, that I'll never be a party to the combination of the butchers to keep up the prices of meat, says he. Mr. Weller, says he, squeezing my hand really hard and whispering in my ear. Don't mention this here again, but it's the seasoning as does it. They're all made of them noble animals, says he, a pointing to a really nice little tabby kitten. And I season him for beefsteak, wheel or kidney, according to the demand. And more than that, says he, I can make a wheel a beefsteak, or a beefsteak a kidney, or any one on him a mutton, at a minute's notice, just as the market changes, and appetites welly. You must have been a very ingenious young man, that, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, with a slight shudder. Just was, yeah, said Mr. Weller, continuing his occupation of emptying the basket. And the pies was beautiful. Tongue. Well, that's a welly good thing when it ain't a woman's. Bread, knuckle of ham, regular picter. Cold beef and slices, welly good. What's in them stone jars, young touch and go? Bear in this one, replied the boy, taking from his shoulder a couple of large stone bottles, fastened together by a leathern strap. Cold punch and tether. And a really good notion of lunch it is. Take it all together, said Mr. Weller, surveying his arrangement of the repast with great satisfaction. Now, gentlemen, fall on, as the English said to the French when they fixed baguette. It needed no second invitation to induce the party to yield full justice to the meal. And as little pressing did it require to induce Mr. Weller, the long gamekeeper, and the two boys to station themselves on the grass at a little distance, and do good execution upon a decent proportion of the viands. An old oak tree afforded a pleasant shelter to the group, and a rich prospect of arable and meadowland, intersected with luxuriant hedges and richly ornamented with wood, lay spread out below them. This is delightful, thoroughly delightful, said Mr. Pickwick, the skin of whose expressive countenance was rapidly peeling off with exposure to the sun. There it is, there it is, old fellow, replied Wardle. Come, a glass of punch. With great pleasure, said Mr. Pickwick, and the satisfaction of his countenance after drinking it bore testimony to the sincerity of the reply. Good, said Mr. Pickwick, smacking his lips. Very good. I'll take another. Cool. Very cool. Come, gentlemen, continued Mr. Pickwick, still retaining his hold upon the jar. A toast, all friends at Dingley Dell. The toast was drunk with loud acclamations. I tell you what I'll do to get up my shooting again, said Mr. Winkle, who was eating bread and ham with a pocket knife. I'll put a stuffed partridge on the top of a post and practice at it, beginning at a short distance and lengthening it by degrees. I understand it's capital practice. I know a gentleman, sir, said Mr. Weller, as did that, and begun at two yards, but he never tried it on again, for he blowed the bird right clean away at the first fire, and nobody ever shaved a feather on him outwards. Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. Sir, replied Mr. Weller, have the goodness to reserve your anecdotes till they are called for. Certainly, sir. Here Mr. Weller winked the eye which was not concealed by the beer can he was raising to his lips with such exquisite facetiousness that the two boys went into spontaneous convulsions, and even the long man condescended to smile. Well, that certainly is most capital cold punch, said Mr. Pickwick, looking earnestly at the stone bottle. And the day is extremely warm, and Tupman, my dear friend, a glass of punch. With the greatest delight, replied Tupman, and having drank that glass, Mr. Pickwick took another just to see whether there was any orange peel in the punch, because orange peel always disagreed with him. And finding that there was not, Mr. Pickwick took another glass to the health of their absent friend, and then felt himself imperatively called upon to propose another in honor of the punch compounder unknown. This constant succession of glasses produced considerable effect upon Mr. Pickwick.
His countenance beamed with the most sunny smiles, laughter played around his lips, and good-humored merriment twinkled in his eye. Yielding by degrees to the influence of the exciting liquid, rendered more so by the heat, Mr. Pickwick expressed a strong desire to recollect a song which he had heard in his infancy, and the attempt proving abortive, sought to stimulate his memory with more glasses of punch, which appeared to have quite a contrary effect, for, from forgetting the words of the song, he began to forget how to articulate any words at all. And finally, after rising to his legs to address the company in an eloquent speech, he fell into the barrow and fast asleep simultaneously. The basket having been repacked, and it being found perfectly impossible to awaken Mr. Pickwick from his torpor, some discussion took place whether it would be better for Mr. Weller to wheel his master back again, or to leave him where he was, until they should all be ready to return. The latter course was at length decided on, and as their further expedition was not to exceed an hour's duration, and as Mr. Weller begged very hard to be one of the party, it was determined to leave Mr. Pickwick asleep in the barrow, and to call for him on their return. So away they went, leaving Mr. Pickwick snoring most comfortably in the shade. That Mr. Pickwick would have continued to snore in the shade until his friends came back, or in default thereof until the shades of evening had fallen on the landscape, there appears no reasonable cause to doubt, always supposing that he had been suffered to remain there in peace. But he was not suffered to remain there in peace, and this is what prevented him. Captain Boldwig was a little fierce man in a stiff black neckerchief and blue surtout, who, when he did condescend to walk about his property, did it in company with a thick rattan stick with a brass ferrule, and a gardener and sub-gardener with meek faces, to whom the gardeners, not the stick, Captain Boldwig gave his orders with all due grandeur and ferocity. For Captain Boldwig's wife's sister had married a marquis, and the captain's house was a villa, and his land grounds, and it was all very high and mighty and great. Mr. Pickwick had not been asleep half an hour, when little Captain Boldwig, followed by the two gardeners, came striding along as fast as his size and importance would let him. And when he came near the old oak tree, Captain Boldwig paused, and drew a long breath, and looked at the prospect, as if he thought the prospect ought to be highly gratified at having him to take notice of it. And then he struck the ground emphatically with his stick, and summoned the head gardener. Hunt, said Captain Boldwig. Yes, sir, said the gardener. Roll this place tomorrow morning. Do you hear, Hunt? Yes, sir. And take care that you keep me this place in good order. Do you hear, Hunt? Yes, sir. And remind me to have a board done about trespassers and spring guns and all that sort of thing to keep the common people out. Do you hear, Hunt? Do you hear? I'll not forget it, sir. I beg your pardon, sir, said the other man, advancing with his hand to his hat. Well, Wilkins, what's the matter with you? said Captain Boldwig. I beg your pardon, sir, but I think there have been trespassers here today. Ha! said the captain, scowling around him. Yes, sir, they have been dining here, I think, sir. Why, damn their audacity, so they have, said Captain Boldwig, as the crumbs and fragments that were strewn upon the grass met his eye. They have actually been devouring their food here. I wish I had the vagabonds here, said the captain, clinching the thick stick. I wish I had the vagabonds here, said the captain wrathfully. Beg your pardon, sir, said Wilkins, but... But what, eh? roared the captain, and following the timid glance of Wilkins, his eyes encountered the wheelbarrow and Mr. Pickwick. Who are you, you rascal? said the captain, administering several pokes to Mr. Pickwick's body with a thick stick. What's your name? Cold Punch, murmured Mr. Pickwick, as he sunk to sleep again. What? demanded Captain Boldwig. No reply. What did he say his name was? asked the captain. Punch, I think, sir, said Wilkins. That's his impudence! That's his confounded impudence! said Captain Boldwig. He's only feigning to be asleep now, said the captain, in a high passion. He's drunk. He's a drunken plebeian. Wheel him away, Wilkins. Wheel him away directly. Where shall I wheel him to, sir? inquired Wilkins, with great timidity. Wheel him to the devil, replied Captain Boldwig. Very well, sir, said Wilkins. Stay, said the captain. Wilkins stopped accordingly. Wheel him, said the captain. Wheel him to the pound, and let us see whether he calls himself Punch when he comes to himself. He shall not bully me. He shall not bully me. Wheel him away. Away Mr. Pickwick was wheeled in compliance with this imperious mandate, and the great Captain Boldwig, swelling with indignation, proceeded on his walk. Inexpressible was the astonishment of the little party when they returned, to find that Mr. Pickwick had disappeared, and taken the wheelbarrow with him. It was the most mysterious and accountable thing that was ever heard of, for a lame man to have got upon his legs without any previous notice, and walked off 
would have been most extraordinary. But when it came to his wheeling a heavy barrow before him, by way of amusement, it grew positively miraculous. They searched every nook and corner around, together and separately. They shouted, whistled, laughed, called, and all with the same result. Mr. Pickwick was not to be found, and after some hours of fruitless search, they arrived at the unwelcome conclusion that they must go home without him. Meanwhile, Mr. Pickwick had been wheeled to the pound and safely deposited therein, fast asleep in the wheelbarrow, to the immeasurable delight and satisfaction not only of all the boys in the village, but three-fourths of the whole population, who had gathered round in expectation of his waking. If their most intense gratification had been awakened by seeing him wheeled in, how many hundredfold was their joy increased when, after a few indistinct cries of, Sam, he sat up in the barrow and gazed with indescribable astonishment on the faces before him. A general shout was, of course, the signal of his having woke up, and his involuntary inquiry of, What's the matter? occasioned another louder than the first, if possible. "'Here's a game!' roared the populace. "'Where am I?' exclaimed Mr. Pickwick. "'In the pound!' replied the mob. "'How came I here? What was I doing? Where was I brought from?' "'Boldwig! Captain Boldwig!' was the only reply. "'Let me out!' cried Mr. Pickwick. "'Where's my servant? Where are my friends?' "'You ain't got no friends! Here are!' And then there came a turnip, and then a potato, and then an egg, with a few other little tokens of the playful disposition of the many-headed." How long this scene might have lasted, or how much Mr. Pickwick might have suffered, no one can tell. Had not a carriage which was driving swiftly by suddenly pulled up, from whence there descended Old Wardle and Sam Weller, the former of whom, in far less time than it takes to write it, if not to read it, had made his way to Mr. Pickwick's side and placed him in the vehicle, just as the latter had concluded the third and last round of single combat with the town beetle. "'Run to the justices!' cried a dozen voices. "'Ah, run of I,' said Mr. Weller, jumping up on the box. "'Give my compliments, Mr. Veller's compliments, to the justice, "'and tell him I spoil his beetle in that. "'If you're swearing a new one, I'll come back again tomorrow and spoil him. "'Drive on, old Veller.' "'I'll give directions for the commencement of an action for false imprisonment "'against this Captain Beldwig directly I get to London,' said Mr. Pickwick, "'as soon as the carriage turned out of the town. "'We were trespassing, it seems,' said Mr. Wardle. "'I don't care,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'I'll bring the action.' "'No, you won't,' said Mr. Wardle. "'I will bite.' But as there was a humorous expression in Wardle's face, Mr. Pickwick checked himself and said, well, Why not? Because, said old Wardle, half bursting with laughter, because they might turn around on some of us and say we had taken too much cold punch. Do what he would, a smile would come into Mr. Pickwick's face. The smile extended into a laugh, the laugh into a roar, and the roar became general. So, to keep up their good humor, they stopped at the first roadside tavern they came to, and ordered a glass of brandy and water all round with a magnum of extra strength for Mr. Samuel Weller. Chapter 20 Showing how Dodson and Fogg were men of business, and their clerks men of pleasure, and how an affecting interview took place between Mr. Weller and his long-lost parent, showing also what choice spirits assembled at the magpie and stump, and what a capital chapter the next one will be. In the ground floor of a front of a dingy house, at the very furthest end of Freeman's Court, Cornhill, sat the four clerks of Messrs. Dodson and Fogg, two of His Majesty's attorneys of the courts of King's Bench and Common Pleas at Westminster, and solicitors of the High Court of Chancery. The aforesaid clerks, catching about as favorable glimpses of heaven's light and heaven's sun, in the course of their daily labors, as a man might hope to do, were he placed at the bottom of a reasonably deep well, and without the opportunity of perceiving the stars in the daytime which the latter secluded situation affords. The clerk's office of Messrs. Dodson and Fogg was a dark, moldy, earthy-smelling room, with a high wainscoted partition to screen the clerks from the vulgar gaze, a couple of old wooden chairs, a very loud ticking clock, an almanac, an umbrella stand, a row of hat pegs, and a few shelves on which were deposited several ticketed bundles of dirty papers, some old deal boxes with paper labels, and sundry decayed stone ink bottles of various shapes and sizes. There was a glass door leading into the passage which formed the entrance to the court, and on the outer side of the glass door, Mr. Pickwick, closely followed by Sam Weller, presented himself on the Friday morning succeeding the occurrence 
of which a faithful narration is given in the last chapter. Come in, can't you? cried a voice from behind the partition, in reply to Mr. Pickwick's gentle tap at the door, and Mr. Pickwick and Sam entered accordingly. Mr. Dalton or Mr. Fogg at home, sir? inquired Mr. Pickwick, gently, advancing, hat in hand, towards the partition. Mr. Dalton ain't at home, and Mr. Fogg's particularly engaged, replied the voice, and at the same time the head to which the voice belonged, with a pin behind its ear, looked over the partition and at Mr. Pickwick. It was a ragged head, the sandy hair of which scrupulously parted on one side and flattened down with pomatum, was twisted into little semicircular tails round the flat face ornamented with a pair of small eyes and garnished with a very dirty shirt collar and rusty black stock. Mr. Dalton in at home, and Mr. Fox particularly engaged, said the man to whom the head belonged. When will Mr. Dalton be back, sir? inquired Mr. Pickwick. Can't say. Will it be long before Mr. Fogg is disengaged, sir? Don't know. Here the man proceeded to mend his pen with great deliberation, while another clerk, who was mixing a seedlitz powder under cover of the lid of his desk, laughed approvingly. I think I'll wait, said Mr. Pickwick. There was no reply. So Mr. Pickwick sat down unbidden and listened to the loud ticking of the clocks and the murmured conversation of the clerks. That was a game, wasn't it? said one of the gentlemen, in a brown coat and brass buttons, inky drabs and blookers, at the conclusion of some inaudible relation of his previous evening's adventures. Devilish good, devilish good, said the Sidlitz powder man. Tom Cummins was in the chair, said the man with the brown coat. It was half past four when I got to Summerstown, and then I was so precious drunk that I couldn't find the place where the latch key went in, and was obliged to knock up the old woman. I say, I wonder what old fog would say if he knew it. I should get the sack, I suppose, eh? At this humorous notion... All the clerks laughed in concert. "'There was such a game with fog here this morning,' said the man in the brown coat, "'while Jack was upstairs sorting the papers, and you two were gone to the stamp office. Fog was down here opening the letters, when that chap as we issued the writ against at Camberwell, you know, came in with... what's his name again?' "'Ramsey,' said the clerk who had spoken to Mr. Pickwick. "'Ah, Ramsey. A precious seedy-looking customer. Well, sir,' says old Fogg, looking at him very fierce. "'You know his way. Well, sir, have you come to settle?' "'Yes, I have, sir.' said Ramsay, putting his hand in his pocket and bringing out the money. The debt's two pound ten, and the cost's three pound five, and here it is, sir. And he sighed like bricks, as he lugged out the money, done up in a bit of blotting paper. Old Fogg looked first at the money, and then at him, and then he coughed in his rum way, so that I knew something was coming. You don't know there's a declaration filed, which increases the cost materially, I suppose, said Fogg. You don't say that, sir, said Ramsay, starting back. The time was only out last night, sir. I do say it, though, said Fogg. My clerk's just gone to file it. Hasn't Mr. Jackson gone to file that declaration in Bowman and Ramsey, Mr. Wicks? Of course, I said yes. And then Fogg coughed again and looked at Ramsey. My God, said Ramsey, and here I have nearly driven myself mad scraping this money together and all to no purpose. Not at all, said Fogg coolly. So you had better go back and scrape some more together and bring it here in time. I can't get it, by God, said Ramsey, striking the desk with his fist. Don't bully me, sir, said Fogg, getting into a passion on purpose. I am not bullying you, sir, said Ramsey. You are, said Fogg. Get out, sir. Get out of this office, sir. And come back, sir, when you know how to behave yourself. Well, Ramsay tried to speak, but Fogg wouldn't let him. So he put the money in his pocket and sneaked out. The door was scarcely shut when old Fogg turned round to me with a sweet smile on his face and drew the declaration out of his coat pocket. Here, Wicks, said Fogg. Take a cab and go down to the temple as quick as you can and file that. The costs are quite safe, for he's a steady man with a large family at a salary of five and twenty shillings a week, and if he gives us a warrant of attorney, as he must in the end, I know his employers will see it paid, so we may as well get all we can out of him, Mr. Wicks. It's a Christian act to do it, Mr. Wicks, for with his large family and small income, he'll be all the better for a good lesson against getting into debt, won't he, Mr. Wicks, won't he? And he smiled so good-naturedly as he went away that it was delightful to see him. He is a capital man of business, said Wicks, in a tone of the deepest admiration. Capital, isn't he? The other three cordially subscribed to this opinion, and the anecdote afforded the most unlimited satisfaction. "'Nice men these here, sir,' whispered Mr. Weller to his master. "'Really nice notion of fun they are, sir.' Mr. Pickwick nodded assent, and coughed to attract the attention of the young gentlemen behind the partition, who, having now relaxed their minds by a little conversation among themselves, condescended to take some notice of the stranger. "'I wonder whether Fogg is disengaged now,' said Jackson. "'Alsey,' said Wicks, dismounting leisurely from his stool. "'What name shall I tell Mr. Fogg?' "'A Pickwick,' replied the illustrious subject of these memoirs. Mr. Jackson departed up the stairs on his errand, and immediately returned with a message that Mr. Fogg would see Mr. Pickwick in five minutes, and having delivered it, returned again to his desk. 
What did he say his name was? whispered Wicks. Pickwick, replied Jackson. It's the defendant in Bald Ellen Pickwick. A sudden scraping of feet, mingled with the sound of suppressed laughter, was heard from behind the partition. They're twigging you, sir, whispered Mr. Weller. Twigging me, Sam? replied Mr. Pickwick. What do you mean by twigging me? Mr. Weller replied by pointing with his thumb over his shoulder, and Mr. Pickwick, on looking up, became sensible of the pleasing fact that all the four clerks, with countenances expressive of the utmost amusement, and their heads thrust over the wooden screen, were minutely inspecting the figure and general appearance of the supposed trifler with female hearts and disturber of female happiness. On his looking up, the row of heads suddenly disappeared, and the sound of pens traveling at a furious rate over paper immediately succeeded. A sudden ring at the bell which hung in the office summoned Mr. Jackson to the apartment of Fogg, from whence he came back to say that he, Fogg, was ready to see Mr. Pickwick if he would step upstairs. Upstairs, Mr. Pickwick did step accordingly, leaving Sam Weller below. The room door of the one pair back bore inscribed in legible characters the imposing words, Mr. Fogg, and, having tapped thereat, and been desired to come in, Jackson ushered Mr. Pickwick into the presence. "'Is Mr. Dalton in?' inquired Mr. Fogg. "'Just come in, sir,' replied Jackson. "'Ask him to step here.' "'Yes, sir,' exit Jackson. "'Take a seat, sir,' said Fogg. "'There's the paper, sir.' "'There's the paper, sir. "'My partner will be here directly, and we can converse about the matter, sir.' Mr. Pickwick took the seat and the paper, but, instead of reading the latter, peeped over the top of it and took a survey of the man of business, who was an elderly, pimply-faced, vegetable diet sort of man, in a black coat, dark mixture trousers, and small black gaiters, a kind of being who seemed to be an essential part of the desk at which he was writing, and to have about as much thought or feeling. After a few minutes' silence, Mr. Dodson, a plump, portly, stern-looking man, with a loud voice appeared, and the conversation commenced. "'This is Mr. Pickwick,' said Fogg. "'Ah, oh, you are the defendant, sir, and Bald Ellen Pickwick,' said Dodson. "'I am, sir,' replied Mr. Pickwick. "'Well, sir,' said Dodson, "'and what do you propose?' "'Ah,' said Fogg, thrusting his hands into his trousers' pockets "'and throwing himself back in his chair. "'What do you propose, Mr. Pickwick?' "'Hush, Fogg,' said Dodson. "'Let me hear what Mr. Pickwick has to say.' "'I came, gentlemen,' replied Mr. Pickwick, "'gazing placidly on the two partners. "'I came here, gentlemen, "'to express the surprise with which I received your letter of the other day, "'and to inquire what grounds of action you can have against me. "'Grounds of—' "'Fogg had ejaculated thus much.' when he was stopped by Dodson. "'Mr. Fogg,' said Dodson, "'I am going to speak.' "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Dodson,' said Fogg. "'For the grounds of action, sir,' continued Dodson, with moral elevation in his air, "'you will consult your own conscience and your own feelings. "'We, sir, we, are guided entirely by the statement of our client. "'That statement, sir, may be true or it may be false. "'It may be credible or it may be incredible. "'But if it be true and if it be credible, "'I do not hesitate to say, sir, "'that our grounds of action, sir,' are strong, and not to be shaken. You may be an unfortunate man, sir, or you may be a designing one, but if I were called upon as a juryman upon my oath, sir, to express an opinion of your conduct, sir, I do not hesitate to assert that I should have but one opinion about it. Here Dodson drew himself up with an air of offended virtue, and looked at Fogg, who thrust his hands further in his pockets, and, nodding his head sagely, said in a tone of the fullest concurrence, Most certainly. Well, sir, said Mr. Pickwick, with considerable pain depicted in his countenance. You will permit me to assure you that I am a most unfortunate man, so far as this case is concerned. I hope you are, sir, replied Dodson. I trust you may be, sir. If you are really innocent of what is laid to your charge, you are more unfortunate than I believed any man could possibly be. What do you say, Mr. Fogg? I say precisely what you say, replied Fogg, with a smile of incredulity. The writ, sir, which commences the action, continued Dodson, was issued regularly. Mr. Fogg, where is the precipi book? Here it is, said Fogg, handing over a square book with a parchment cover. Here's the entry, resumed Dodson. Middlesex, Capius Martha Bardell, widow v. Samuel Pickwick. Damages, 1,500 pounds. Dodson and Fogg for the plaintiff, August 28th, 1827. All regular, sir, perfectly. And Dodson coughed and looked at Fogg, who said, perfectly, also. And then they both looked at Mr. Pickwick. I am to understand, then, said Mr. Pickwick, that it really is your intention to proceed with this action? Understand, sir, that you certainly may, replied Dodson, with something as near a smile as his importance would allow. And that the damages are actually laid at fifteen hundred pounds, said Mr. Pickwick, to which understanding you may add upon my assurance that if we could have prevailed upon our client 
They would have been laid at treble the amount, sir, replied Dodson. I believe Mrs. Bardell specially said, however, observed Fogg, glancing at Dodson, that she would not compromise for a farthing less. Unquestionably, replied Dodson sternly, for the action was only just begun, and it wouldn't have done to let Pickwick compromise it then, even if he had been so disposed. As you offer no terms, sir, said Dodson, displaying a slip of parchment in his right hand, and affectionately pressing a paper copy of it on Mr. Pickwick with his left. I had better serve you with a copy of this writ, sir. Here is the original, sir. Very well, gentlemen, very well, said Mr. Pickwick, rising in person and wrath at the same time. You shall hear from my solicitor, gentlemen. We shall be very happy to do so, said Fogg, rubbing his hands. Very, said Dodson, opening the door. And before I go, gentlemen, said the excited Mr. Pickwick, turning round on the landing, permit me to say that of all the disgraceful and rascally proceedings... Stay, sir, stay, interposed Dodson, with great politeness. Mr. Jackson, Mr. Wicks, sir, said the two clerks, appearing at the bottom of the stairs. I just want you to hear what this gentleman says, replied Dodson. Pray, go on, sir. Disgraceful and rascally proceedings, I think you said. I did, said Mr. Pickwick, thoroughly roused. I said, sir, that of all the disgraceful and rascally proceedings that ever were attempted, this is the most so. I repeat it, sir. Do you hear that, Mr. Wicks, said Dodson. You won't forget these expressions, Mr. Jackson, said Fogg. Perhaps you would like to call a swindler, sir, said Dodson. Pray do so, sir, if you feel disposed. Now pray do, sir. I do, said Mr. Pickwick. You are swindlers. Very good, said Mr. Dodson. You can hear down there, I hope, Mr. Wicks. Oh, yes, sir, said Wicks. You'd better come up a step or two higher if you can't, added Mr. Fogg. Go on, sir, do go on. You had better call us thieves, sir. Or perhaps you would like to assault one of us. Pray do it, sir, if you would. We will not make the smallest resistance. Pray do it, sir. As Fogg put himself very temptingly within the reach of Mr. Pickwick's clenched fist, there is little doubt that that gentleman would have complied with his earnest entreaty, but for the interposition of Sam, who, hearing the dispute, emerged from the office, mounted the stairs, and seized his master by the arm. "'You just come if I,' said Mr. Weller. "'Battledore and Shuttlecock's a very good game, when you ain't the Shuttlecock, and two lawyers the Battledores, in which case it gets too exciting to be pleasant. Come if I, sir. If you want to ease your mind by blowing up somebody, Come out into the court and blow up me, but it's rather too expensive work to be carried on here. And without the slightest ceremony, Mr. Weller hauled his master down the stairs and down the court, and having safely deposited him in Cornhill, fell behind, prepared to follow whithersoever he should lead. Mr. Pickwick walked on abstractedly, crossed opposite the mansion house, and bent his steps up Cheapside. Sam began to wonder where they were going when his master turned around and said, "'Sam, I will go immediately to Mr. Perkers.' "'That is just exactly the only place you ought to have gone last night,' replied Mr. Weller. "'I think it is, Sam,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'I know it is,' said Mr. Weller. "'Well, well, Sam,' replied Mr. Pickwick. "'We will go there at once. "'But first, as I have been rather ruffled, "'I should like a glass of brandy and water warm, Sam. "'Where can I have it, Sam?' "'Mr. Weller's knowledge of London was extensive and peculiar. "'He replied, without the slightest consideration, she ain't caught on the right hand side. That's how she put fun on the same side of the vibe. Take the box I stands in the first fireplace, cause there ain't no leg in the middle of the table, which all the others has, and it's witty and convenient. Mr. Pickwick observed his valet's directions implicitly, and bidding Sam follow him, entered the tavern he had pointed out, where the hot brandy and water was speedily placed before him. While Mr. Weller, seated at a respectful distance, though at the same table with his master, was accommodated with a pint of porter. The room was one of a very homely description, and was apparently under the especial patronage of stage coachmen, for several gentlemen, who had all the appearance of belonging to that learned profession, were drinking and smoking in the different boxes. Among the number was one stout, red-faced, elderly man in particular, seated in an opposite box, who attracted Mr. Pickwick's attention. The stout man was smoking with great vehemence, but between every half-dozen puffs, he took his pipe from his mouth and looked first at Mr. Weller and then at Mr. Pickwick. Then he would bury in a quart pot as much of his countenance as the dimensions of the quart pot admitted of its receiving and take another look at Sam and Mr. Pickwick. Then he would take another half-dozen puffs with an air of profound meditation and look at them again. And at last the stout man, putting up his legs on the seat and leaning his back against the wall, began to puff at his pipe without leaving off at all, and to stare through the smoke at the newcomers as if he had made up his mind to see the most he could of them. At first the evolutions of the stout man had escaped Mr. Weller's observations, 
but by degrees he saw Mr. Pickwick's eyes every now and then turning towards him, and he began to gaze in the same direction, at the same time shading his eyes with his hand, as if he partially recognized the object before him, and wished to make quite sure of its identity. His doubts were speedily dispelled, however, for the stout man having blown a thick cloud from his pipe, a hoarse voice, like some strange effort of ventriloquism, emerged from beneath the capacious shawls which muffled his throat and chest, and slowly uttered these sounds. "'Why, Shammy!' "'Who's that, Sam?' inquired Mr. Pickwick. "'Why, I wouldn't have believed it, eh? Yeah? replied Mr. Weller with astonished eyes. "'It's the old one.' "'Old one?' said Mr. Pickwick. "'What old one?' "'My father, sir,' replied Mr. Weller. "'How are you, my ancient?' And with this beautiful ebullition of filial affection, Mr. Weller made room on the seat beside him for the stout man who advanced pipe in mouth and pot in hand to greet him. "'Why, Shammy,' said the father, "'I hadn't seen you for two years and better.' "'No more you have, old codger,' replied the son. "'I was mother-in-law.' "'Why, I tell you what, Shammy,' said Mr. Weller, senior, with much solemnity in his manner. "'There never was a nicer woman as a widow than that air second winter of mine. A sweet creature she was, Shammy.' And all I can say on her now is that as she was such an uncommon pleasant widow, it's a great pity she ever changed her condition. She don't act as a wife, Jamie. Don't she, though? inquired Mr. Weller, Jr. The elder Mr. Weller shook his head as he replied with a sigh. I've done it once too often, Jamie. I've done it once too often. Take example by your father, my boy, and be very careful of widows all your life, especially if they've kept a public house, Jamie. And having delivered this parental advice with great pathos, Mr. Weller Sr. refilled his pipe from a tin box he carried in his pocket, and, lighting his fresh pipe from the ashes of the old one, commenced smoking at a great rate. "'Beg your pardon, sir,' he said, renewing the subject and addressing Mr. Pickwick after a considerable pause. "'Nothing personal, I hope, sir. I hope you ain't gotten a widow, sir.' Uh, "'Not I,' replied Mr. Pickwick, laughing. And while Mr. Pickwick laughed, Sam Weller informed his parent in a whisper— of the relation in which he stood towards that gentleman. "'Beg your pardon, sir,' said Mr. Weller, Sr., taking off his hat. "'I hope you have no fault to find with Sammy, sir.' "'None whatever,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'Really glad to hear it, sir,' replied the old man. "'I took a great deal of pains with his education, sir. "'Let him run in the streets when he was really young, "'and shift for his shelf. "'It's the only way to make a boy sharp, sir.' "'Rather a dangerous process, I should imagine,' "'said Mr. Pickwick, with a smile. "'And not a really sure one, neither,' added Mr. Weller. "'I got regularly done the other day.' No, said the father. I did, said the son, and he proceeded to relate in as few words as possible how he had fallen a ready dupe to the stratagems of Job Trotter. Mr. Weller Sr. listened to the tale with the most profound attention, and, at its termination, said, What one of these chaps slim and tall, with long hair and the gift of the gab would he gallopin'? Mr. Pickwick did not quite understand the last item of description, but, comprehending the first, said, Yes, at a venture. The other's a black-haired chap in Mulberry livery, with a really large head. Yes, yes, he is, said Mr. Pickwick and Sam, with great earnestness. Then I know where they are, and that's all about it, said Mr. Weller. They're at Ipswich, safe enough, them two. No, said Mr. Pickwick. Fact, said Mr. Weller, and I'll tell you how I know it. I work at Ipswich coach now and then for a friend of mine. I work down the welly day out of the night as you caught the rheumatage, and at the black boy at Kelmersford, the welly place they'd come to. I took him up. Right through to Ipswich, where the manservant, him and the Mulberries, told me he was going to put up for a long time. I'll follow him, said Pickwick. We may as well see Ipswich as any other place. I'll follow him. You're quite certain it was them, Governor? inquired Mr. Weller, Jr. Quite, Sammy, quite, replied his father. Well, their appearance is really singular. Besides that here, I wondered to see the gentleman so familiar with his servant, and, more than that, as they sat in front, right behind the box, I heard them laughing and seeing how they'd done old fireworks. Old who? said Mr. Pickwick. Old fireworks, sir, by which I've no doubt they meant you, sir. There is nothing positively vile or atrocious in the appellation of old fireworks, but still it is by no means a respectful or flattering designation. The recollection of all the wrongs he had sustained at Jingle's hands had crowded on Mr. Pickwick's mind the moment Mr. Weller began to speak. It wanted but a feather to turn the scale, and old fireworks did it. I'll follow him, said Mr. Pickwick, with an emphatic blow on the table. I shall work down to Ipswich the day out of tomorrow, sir, said Mr. Weller, the elder, from the Bull in Whitechapel, and if you really mean to go, you'd better go with me. So we had, said Mr. Pickwick. Very true. I can write to Barry and tell them to meet me at Ipswich. We will go with you. 
But don't hurry away, Mr. Weller. Won't you take anything? You're very good, sir, replied Mr. W., stopping short. Perhaps a small glass of brandy to drink to your health, and success to Sammy, sir, wouldn't be amiss. Certainly not, replied Mr. Weller. A glass of brandy here. The brandy was brought, and Mr. Weller, after pulling his hair to Mr. Pickwick and nodding to Sam, jerked it down his capacious throat as if it had been a small thimbleful. Well done, father, said Sam. Take care, old fellow, or you'll have to touch your old complaint, the gout. I found a sovereign cure for that, Jamie, replied Mr. Weller, setting down the glass. A sovereign cure for the gout, said Mr. Pickwick, hastily producing his notebook. What is it? The gout, sir, replied Mr. Weller. The gout is a complaint as arises from too much ease and comfort. If ever you're attacked with the gout, sir, just you marry a widow and has got a good loud voice with a decent notion of using it, and you'll never have the gout again. It's a capital prescription, sir. I takes it regular, and I can warrant it to drive away any illness as is caused by too much jollity. Having imparted this valuable secret, Mr. Weller drained his glass once more, produced a labored wink, sighed deeply, and slowly retired. "'Well, what do you think of what your father says, Sam?' inquired Mr. Pickwick with a smile. "'Thanks, sir,' replied Mr. Weller. "'Why, I think he's the victim of connubiality, as Bluebird's domestic chaplain said, with a tear of pity, but he buried him.' There was no replying to this very apposite conclusion, and therefore Mr. Pickwick after settling the reckoning, resumed his walk to Gray's Inn. By the time he reached its secluded groves, however, eight o'clock had struck, and the unbroken stream of gentlemen in muddy high lows, soiled white hats, and rusty apparel, who were pouring towards the different avenues of egress, warned him that the majority of the offices had closed for that day. After climbing two pairs of steep and dirty stairs, he found his anticipations were realized. Mr. Perker's outer door was closed, and the dead silence, which followed Mr. Weller's repeated kicks thereat, announced that the officials had retired from business for the night. "'This is pleasant, Sam,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'I shouldn't lose an hour in seeing him. I shall not be able to get one wink of sleep tonight, I know, unless I have the satisfaction of reflecting that I have confided this matter to a professional man.' "'Here's an old woman coming upstairs, sir,' eh? replied Mr. Weller. "'Perhaps she knows where we can find somebody. Hello, old lady! Where's Mr. Perker's people?' "'Mr. Perker's people?' said a thin, miserable-looking old woman, stopping to recover breath after the ascent of the staircase. Mr. Perker's people's gone, and I'm a-going to do the office out. Are you Mr. Perker's servant? inquired Mr. Pickwick. I am Mr. Perker's laundress, replied the old woman. Ah, said Mr. Pickwick, half aside to Sam. It's a curious circumstance, Sam, that they call the old women in these inns laundresses. I wonder what that's for. Because they has a mortal aversion to washing anything, I suppose, yeah, replied Mr. Weller. I shouldn't wonder said Mr. Pickwick, looking at the old woman, whose appearance, as well as the condition of the office, which she had by this time opened, indicated a rooted antipathy to the application of soap and water. "'Do you know where I can find Mr. Perker, my good woman?' "'No, I don't,' replied the old woman gruffly. "'He's out of town now.' "'That's unfortunate,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'Where's his clerk, do you know?' "'Yes, I know where he is, but he wouldn't thank me for telling you,' replied the laundress. "'I have very particular business with him,' said Mr. Pickwick." "'Won't it do in the morning?' said the woman. "'Not so well,' replied Mr. Pickwick. "'Well,' said the old woman, "'if it was anything very particular, "'I wish to say where he was, "'so I suppose there's no harm in telling. "'If you just go to the magpie and stump "'and ask at the bar for Mr. Loughton, "'they'll show you into him, "'and he's Mr. Perker's clerk.' "'With this direction, "'and having been furthermore informed "'that the hostelry in question "'was situated in a court, happy in the double advantage of being in the vicinity of Clare Market, and closely approximating to the back of New Inn, Mr. Pickwick and Sam descended the rickety staircase in safety and issued forth in quest of the magpie and stump. This favored tavern, sacred to the evening orgies of Mr. Loughton and his companions, was what ordinary people would designate a public house. That the landlord was a man of a money-making turn, was sufficiently testified by the fact of a small bulkhead beneath the taproom window, in size and shape not unlike a sedan chair, being underlet to a mender of shoes, and that he was a being of a philanthropic mind, was evident from the protection afforded to a pie man who vended his delicacies without fear of interruption on the very doorstep. In the lower windows, which were decorated with curtains of a saffron hue, dangled two or three printed cards, bearing reference to Devonshire Cider and Danzig Spruce, while a large black board announcing in white letters to an enlightened public that there were 500,000 barrels of double stout in the cellars of the establishment 
left the mind in a state of not unpleasing doubt and uncertainty as to the precise direction in the bowels of the earth in which this mighty cavern might be supposed to extend. When we add that the weather-beaten signboard bore the half-obliterated semblance of a magpie intently eyeing a crooked streak of brown paint, which the neighbors had been taught from infancy to consider as the stump, we have said all that need be said of the exterior of the edifice. On Mr. Pickwick's presenting himself at the bar, an elderly female emerged from behind a screen therein and presented herself before him. "'Is Mr. Loughton here, ma'am?' inquired Mr. Pickwick. "'Yes, he is, sir,' replied the landlady. "'Here, Charlie, show the gentleman in to Mr. Loughton.' "'The gentleman can't go in just now,' said a shambling pot boy with a red head, "'cause Mr. Loughton's just singing a comic song, and they'll put him out. He'll be done directly, sir.' The red-headed pot boy had scarcely finished speaking when a most unanimous hammering of tables and jingling of glasses announced that the song had that instant terminated, and Mr. Pickwick, after desiring Sam to solace himself in the tap, suffered himself to be conducted into the presence of Mr. Loughton. At the announcement of, A gentleman to speak to you, sir, a puffy-faced young man who filled the chair at the head of the table looked with some surprise in the direction from whence the voice proceeded, and the surprise seemed to be by no means diminished when his eyes rested on an individual whom he had never seen before. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Mr. Pickwick, "'and I am very sorry to disturb the other gentleman, too, "'but I come on very particular business, "'and if you will suffer me to detain you at this end of the room for five minutes, "'I shall be very much obliged to you.' The puffy-faced young man rose, and drawing a chair close to Mr. Pickwick in an obscure corner of the room, listened attentively to his tale of woe. Ah, he said, when Mr. Pickwick had concluded. Dalton and Fogg, sharp practice theirs. Capital men of business is Dalton and Fogg, sir. Mr. Pickwick admitted the sharp practice of Dalton and Fogg, and Loughton resumed. Perker ain't in town, and he won't be neither before the end of next week. But if you want the action defended, and will leave the copy with me, I can do all that's needful till he comes back. That's exactly what I came here for, said Mr. Pickwick, handing over the document. If anything particular occurs, you can write to me at the post office Ipswich. "'That's all right,' replied Mr. Perker's clerk. And then seeing Mr. Pickwick's eye wandering curiously toward the table, he added, "'Will you join us for half an hour or so? "'We are capital company here tonight. "'There's Samkin and Green's managing clerk, "'and Smithers and Price's chancery, "'and Pimpkin and Thomas's out at all. "'Sings a capital song, he does. "'And Jack Bamber, and ever so many more. "'You've come out to the country, I suppose. "'Would you like to join us?' Mr. Pickwick could not resist so tempting an opportunity of studying human nature." He suffered himself to be led to the table, where, after having been introduced to the company in due form, he was accommodated with a seat near the chairman and called for a glass of his favorite beverage. A profound silence, quite contrary to Mr. Pickwick's expectation, succeeded. "'You don't find this sort of thing disagreeable, I hope, sir,' said his right-hand neighbor, a gentleman in a checked shirt and mosaic studs, with a cigar in his mouth. "'Not in the least,' replied Mr. Pickwick. "'I like it very much, although I am no smoker myself.' "'I should be very sorry to say I wasn't,' interposed another gentleman on the opposite side of the table. "'It's board and lodging to me, you smoke.' Mr. Pickwick glanced at the speaker, and thought that if it were washing, too, it would be all the better. Here there was another pause. Mr. Pickwick was a stranger, and his coming had evidently cast a damp upon the party. "'Mr. Grundy's going to oblige the company with a song,' said the chairman. "'No, he ain't,' said Mr. Grundy. "'Why not?' said the chairman. "'Because I can't,' said Mr. Grundy. "'You had better say you won't,' replied the chairman. "'Well, then, I won't.' retorted Mr. Grundy. Mr. Grundy's positive refusal to gratify the company occasioned another silence. "'Won't anybody enliven us?' said the chairman despondingly. "'Why don't you enliven us yourself, Mr. Chairman?' said a young man with a whisker, a squint, and an open shirt collar, dirty, from the bottom of the table. "'Yeah,' said the smoking gentleman in the mosaic jewelry. "'Because I know only one song, and I have sung it already, and it's a fine of glasses round to sing the same song twice in a night,' replied the chairman." This was an unanswerable reply, and silence prevailed again. "'I have been tonight, gentlemen,' said Mr. Pickwick, hoping to start a subject which all the company would take part in discussing. "'I have been tonight in a place which you all know very well, doubtless, but which I have not been in before for some years, and know very little of it. I mean Gray's Inn, gentlemen. Curious little nooks in a great place like London these old inns are.' "'By Jove!' said the chairman, whispering across the table to Mr. Pickwick. You have hit upon something that one of us, at least, would talk upon forever. You'll draw old Jack Bamber out. He was never heard to talk about anything else but the inns, and he has lived alone in them, till he's half crazy. The individual to whom Lawton alluded was a little yellow high-shouldered man whose countenance 
from his habit of stooping forward when silent, Mr. Pickwick had not observed before. He wondered, though, when the old man raised his shriveled face and bent his bright gray eye upon him with a keen, inquiring look that such remarkable features that such remarkable features could have escaped his attention for a moment. There was a fixed, grim smile perpetually on his countenance. He leant his chin on a long, skinny hand with nails of extraordinary length, and as he inclined his head to one side and looked keenly out from beneath his ragged gray eyebrows, there was a strange, wild slyness in his leer, quite repulsive to behold. This was the figure that now started forward and burst into an animated torrent of words. As this chapter has been a long one, however, and as the old man was a remarkable personage, it will be more respectful to him, and more convenient to us, to let him speak for himself in a fresh one.